Good evening and welcome to this week's uh, Curator Confidential, our weekly uh, live program that we uh, seek out and uh, sort of gives our the, us curators a chance to share some unexpected stories through the lens of our collection while we remain closed. I'm Mike Thornton, the Associate Curator of Material Culture here at the New York Historical Society. And I'd just like to extend a special thanks to our chairman, council, our museum members, and our donors for their generosity in our continued effort to help uh, make history matter. Uh, just a couple um, rules and regulations for tonight's talk. You know, the talk will run in total about 45 minutes, 30 minutes of me talking, and uh, reserving 15 minutes at the end for questions. Now, you can ask questions via the uh, the, uh, hold on, the uh, Zoom Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screen, but uh, we're going to answer them in as many as we can uh, at the end of the presentation, but we're keeping track, so submit your questions as they come up and I'll do what I can uh, to answer them. So uh, with that, uh, let's uh, get started. So uh, tonight's story is a long time in coming. It's been on my mind for a number of years. I'm, I consider myself the luckiest curator in the museum because I get to work with the Journey Collection, which is our 9,000 plus assemblage of vintage transportation toys, mostly trains, stations, and accessories. And this uh, amazing, it's a three, almost three feet, it's a little bit more than three feet long toy pond boat was made by Gerbruder Bing in the 1920s for the American market. It depicts a ship, uh, an ocean liner named uh, the SS Leviathan, which uh, had come into the United States uh, when it was Shanghai, for lack of a better word, as a troop ship uh, during World War I. Of course, the ship was a foreman German liner, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But during its uh, war service, it uh, ended up participating in a rather unfortunate way in the second wave of the 1918 influenza pandemic. And it's a story that's sort of gone down in maritime lore as one of the great terrible voyages on the North Atlantic. But uh, it was something I've always wanted to learn more about. And in doing so, um, really was able to get at the heart of the experiences of the people who were on the ship at that time, which I think in our certainly our COVID-19 uh, crisis, we can empathize with and uh, it's a very timely story. But here is, here is the Leviathan toy uh, painted in the livery of the United States Lines, 1920. This is a clockwork toy steamboat. If you had a bathtub, it would probably take up most of the bathtub, but it was really meant to be used in ponds and lakes and local parks. And uh, a single wind of the clockwork motor inside powered the toy for about 40 minutes, which is pretty, this is something. But it began its life as a German liner named the Varderland. And why don't we go to the next slide, please? So here's the Varderland on her ways at the, at the Hamburg American uh, line who commissioned and paid for the ship. In Ham and the ship was built in Hamburg. It's launching into the Elba River. The ship was so huge that it came within meters of colliding with the other side of the riverbank. About 40,000 people attended the launch. And the launch of these great ocean liners, uh, they were highly publicized and aggrandized. They were really considered ships of state. And we have to um, remember that before the war, you know, really going back into the late 1890s, there had been a maritime arms race where both Germany and England were vying for maritime supremacy. Everyone was building bigger and faster and stronger warships. Ocean liners played a part in that and they were kind of a peaceful veneer that was laid over this competition. So ocean liners, especially the grand ships like Lusitania, the Mauritania, Titanic and Olympic, Varderland and her sister, the Imperator, and later the Bismarck were all considered uh, ships of state. And why don't we look at the next slide. So I'd actually like to get a little sense from the audience, uh, how many of you out there are uh, nautically minded or, or land lovers, uh, actually like myself, don't tell. Um, so we'll have to do one of our first Zoom polls. Have you uh, ever crossed an ocean in a naval or passenger ship? Doesn't matter if it's the Atlantic, the Pacific, the North Sea. Uh, let me know. I'll give you about 15 seconds to respond here.
Aha. Yes, I suspected. Uh, the, the, the 61% of you have not crossed, about 39% of you have. Um, it's interesting. Um, the North Atlantic passenger experience is largely considered a, uh, a luxury uh, these days. It's done for recreation. It has kind of fallen in by the wayside. But at the time when um, ships like the Varderland and the Titanic and Olympic and Lusitania Mauritania were capturing headlines and speed records for that matter, um, while they're, these great ships are certainly associated with luxury, I think it's really, really important to remember that two thirds of all of those companies operating budgets were paid for by immigrants coming to the United States looking for a new life. And so when you, they built these great ships with tremendous decoration and thought about their luxury, but they were really just massive ways of moving people across the Atlantic, which will uh, come in handy with World War One. But uh, think about being an immigrant at that moment in time, maybe say 1910, 1912. Uh, you've saved uh, maybe a whole lifetime uh, for your ticket on one of these ships. And the notion of crossing the Atlantic is just as daunting as it was in the uh, 19, you know, 18th and 19th centuries as it was in the early 20th. And so every attempt with these great ships was to make you forget that you were at sea. Uh, but nonetheless, the lessons of the Titanic are sort of evident in this photo. And just to give you a sense of size, I have uh, taken the facade of the historic 19, uh, let's say 1910 historical society, what it looked like then, and put it to scale next to the bow of the Varderland here, sort of plowing forward. It only really comes up, that facade only comes up to the uh, auxiliary anchor. It gives you a sense of just how massive the ship was. I also wanted to call out some Titanic uh, safety features. They have added a searchlight uh, to the mast there. And you can see that the arrow points to the searchlight on the main mast. And below that, you have racks and racks of additional lifeboats. Uh, the Varderland could clip along at about 23 knots. So it crossed the Atlantic in about five days, which was pretty good for the time. Why don't we go to the next slide? Now, the Varderland entered service in the summer of 1914, and it was able to make a couple trips between uh, New York and Hamburg, uh, generally taking about 16 days to make the complete round trip uh, before war was declared in August of that year. Now, uh, without thinking about this, and likely a, a strategic mistake on the part of the German uh, Army and Navy was to have the Varderland, in addition to other 90 capital merchant ships, be trapped in foreign ports when war was declared. So here we see the Varderland trapped in Hoboken at her pier, uh, manned only by a skeleton crew sort of awaiting its fate. And uh, for a while, the ship was used as a fundraiser for pro-Kaiser events until anti-German sentiment in New York City put the kibosh on that. Sensing that the ship might be seized by the United States after events like the Lusitania, the crew set about disassembling the engine and mixing up water pipes so that if it was ever fired up again, toilets might issue steam while showers might spill uh, bilge water, which was kind of uh, unfortunate for the United States. Why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, the, the Varderland uh, was renamed af uh, after it was seized by the United States in July of 1917. The German crew who had been on board was taken to Ellis Island and lore has it is that they were offered uh, citizenship, but I could never find any actual verifiable proof that that is exactly what happened. But they were sent to military prison at Fort uh, Oglethorpe down in uh, uh, Georgia. But here we see, we get a sense of the massive amount of people power that it took to man these ships. Uh, the ship was renamed Leviathan by Woodrow Wilson's wife after the biblical sea monster. It took about 2,000 a crew uh, to, to helm the vessel. I haven't counted all the, uh, <laughs> the heads in that picture, but I have to admit as a father, it makes me very nervous, all the young men climbing the the ropes there. I hope they're holding on tight. Uh, why don't we take another uh, look at the next slide here. Now the Leviathan enters into war service to supply the very essential function of getting the United States Army to France to participate in the war. And it launches its first uh, troop ship voyage 
in uh, December of 1917. Now in that summer, while they were sorting out the debacle with the steam pipes and the toilets, uh, they were literally stripping the ship of its fine decorative uh, furnishings. Staterooms were, the walls were taken down so they could fit miles and miles of uh, troop uh, bunks. This is a very rare photograph that I stumbled across. And the, the notion of crossing on these troop ships uh, was quite intimidating with the uh, claustrophobic uh, sit, uh, situation inside. We'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. But the biggest danger, of course, on the Atlantic is the threat of German submarines. And um, so no one wants to be torpedoed because the North Atlantic is an extremely inhospitable environment. And this is a photo of the Leviathan's nurse um, a contingent. And they're actually wearing a uniform that I had no idea had even existed in World War I. You're looking at an early attempt by the United States Navy to create a North Atlantic survival suit. And should these women end up in the water, which even on a good day is probably only about 28 degrees, you wouldn't live longer than maybe 15 or 20 minutes before dying of exposure. This was some effort at least to uh, protect the women aboard in classic uh, Gilded Age uh, sentiment there, giving them more of a fighting chance should the ship uh, go down. But a very rare photo and, and even you know, having studied military material culture for, for years, I have no idea that these efforts were made. Uh, why don't we look at the next slide? Now, but our talk uh, focuses on the influenza pandemic and its intersection with the Leviathan on its fateful ninth overseas crossing, which took place from September 29th uh, and until they made uh, landfall on October 8th in Brest, France. Um, there's about 2,220 crewmen on board the ship that we know of at that time, in addition to uh, passengers, uh, troops, soldiers, men and women being transported to France. And some of the units that were on this particular voyage included the 323rd Field uh, Signal Corps. You can sort of think of them as battlefield communications and documentary services. There were four different engineering regiments. Uh, there was a water tank train, and it was these men's job to carry uh, on horses, uh, huge casks, wooden casks of fresh water to the front for the soldiers. And then the troop contingent included the 57th Pioneer Infantry Regiment. These men were drawn from the National Guard units of Vermont, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania. And they were going to France to serve as engineers, but they were also trained as riflemen and could be called up uh, to fight in a moment's notice. Now, through a stroke of luck, the Leviathan would also be transporting 191 nurses from the 60th and 62nd Army Base Hospitals and they were in for an unexpected adventure of their life. Um, you're looking at a troop billet card. Now, if you can think of, uh, thinking back to our poll where 60% of us have never been to sea, the notion of suddenly getting aboard this massive multiple deck ship that's an absolute labyrinth of rooms. Um, you were issued a troop billet card that gave you uh, the location of your bunk. So for instance, FRS-3 is your compartment number located on F deck amidship, you were given a deck space where you could recreate, a latrine space for other necessities, and an abandoned ship muster station, in this case at the bottom of that card, number 12 on A deck. Um, but that was all the instruction you were given. <laughs> um, why don't we actually take this moment to, I'm gonna screen a video here, a, a, a propaganda film, a silent film from World War I that, uh, gives a little bit of sense of what uh, it was like to be aboard. But before these people, uh, these soldiers and these nurses had boarded, as the 57th began to march towards the Hoboken Pier, men began to become ill with influenza. Now, in the uh, late su early summer, late spring, early summer of 1918, the second wave of the influenza pandemic began to spread through the United States. And unlike the first wave, for reasons we still don't fully understand, the second wave seemed in particularly indiscriminate about who it killed. And for the first time, young people, surprisingly healthy people, especially young soldiers, uh, were dying at, um, sometimes within hours of contracting the virus. The men of the 57th, they literally began to fall out of the ranks on the pier side. The doctors and nurses know what's happening, but they're helpless to stop it. Orders are orders, and they have to get on the ship to go to France. So they're led on board. Let's take, let's go back and 
travel on the Leviathan here for, for uh, a couple minutes. Now, we're looking at the ship's uh, foc'sle here, um, looking towards the bow. Um, and uh, you see troops, you can just see how milling about they are. They're probably in line heading down, uh, we assume, to get a meal where they would be given regular times. You can read there about the commissary and the, uh, the various facts there. Uh, just a couple of things that I find fascinating. It was difficult to watch this in uh, thinking about COVID-19. <laughs> Certainly not a lot of social distancing going on. Look at the porthole behind the cooks. It has been blacked out. And that is to prevent any light from inside the ship seeping out. A light at sea could be spotted up to 15, 20 miles away and could reveal the presence of the ship to submarines. Here we have uh, officers, uh, chief petty officers to be exact, inspecting uh, the ship. I kind of like to think that this movie must have been made to convince mothers that their boys going overseas were going to be well fed and apple pie would be abundant for all. Um, but there's kind of a moment of humor here with this uh, soldier. <laughs> He's, uh, yep, the cake, the pie looks good, and putting it back, and that's perfectly healthy to do that, right? Uh, inspecting <laughs> the potatoes. Again, very poor light conditions in here, no light at all, and that, that's probably all coming from the cinematographer's uh, kit. Um, and we'll see here some troops uh, feeding. Look at the, you know, so many men on board. Uh, in their life jackets, bulky and claustrophobic. They're eating from their mess kits that have been issued to them. I think those armbands around them are different ways of designating what comp troop compartments they belong to, but uh, if anyone knows for sure, uh, please please let me chime in and let me know at the end of the presentation. Um, the men had the luxury of dining camp style in the first class salon there, um, maybe not the same meals that might have been enjoyed aboard the Barterland long ago, but I'm sure they were happy uh, to eat it. Here, here they are, a diving. But again, such close proximity, very dark. Um, uh, there's very little photographs of the interior of the ship uh, just because of the lighting conditions. So this is kind of a rare, rare view. Um, peeling potatoes, it's, it's army life, what can you say? And now this space in particular, let's see if they'll show it here. Was that the, oh. Well, maybe that's a good segue. Why don't we actually go to the, the next slide here? There we go. So two days out, the damage has been done. There's an estimated 700 flu cases literally overwhelm the sick bay here. Now, on a good day, the Navy is no stranger to shipboard illness. They had anticipated something might happen. The Leviathan carried about 182 beds with an additional 40 beds in a special isolation ward. You're looking at the main sick bay here. It's about, uh, you can see some of those beds. I suspect that the, the wood structure off to the one side there is either isolation units or uh, officers' quarters for the medical staff. But this space is completely overwhelmed within two days out, and the patients just keep coming. Um, they're running out of blankets. There was only 100 blankets on board. Um, so soldiers begin to surrender their blankets to their comrades who are being racked by bone-chilling bone uh, fevers. Why don't we look at the next slide? This is another rare view. Um, this is taken, I think, on a homeward bound voyage uh, after the war. But uh, again, it, it shows uh, a scene uh, on board the ship. Um, healthy soldiers, realizing what was going on, had no desire to be in their troop compartments. And so they began to mill about the ship, uh, spreading the virus, uh, seeking a safer refuge. Now, uh, one thing to maybe call out uh, in this photo, um, that uh, appears in a lot of photos of the pandemic was their sort of way of uh, personal protective equipment. And you see these uh, canvas uh, dividers on the one side of the photograph and there's some sick or wounded soldiers. I suspect that they're probably wounded, but nonetheless, those dividers would not have been there had it not been for the, uh, the terrible lessons learned at the front from influenza and the army and navy orders called that sort of rigging a sneeze guard 
which I think we can all uh, relate to uh, today. But um, so here's just kind of a sense of where soldiers were taking refuge aboard the ship. But in doing so, they're carrying the virus. Why don't we go to the next slide? Now, four days out, 2,000 people have become infected. And just look at this troop deck here for a minute. This was probably a former uh, stateroom hallway where there might have been three or four cabins housing maybe 20 people total. And now it's housing maybe 100, if not 200 individual soldiers. There's about five bunks per vertical uh, structure there. Nobody wants to be down there. And soon these spaces, everyone who is in them is, has a fever, is vomiting, is bleeding from their nose. They've run out of blankets. The ship's medical staff is absolutely overwhelmed and is looking to find some way to comfort these men. Uh, but it's simply, uh, it's, it's, the fire is out of hand. By this uh, time in the voyage, the chief medical officer um, has uh, become ill himself. And so there's a, a sincere lack of leadership about how to sort of manage this uh, crisis that is uh, flaring up like a wildfire on board. Why don't we look at the next, next slide? Um, and here I'd like to actually uh, just take a minute to do another Zoom poll. And I want to just uh, prefer, uh, preface this. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll, we'll go into the results maybe after why, why I ask. I'm just be curious uh, how many of you out there in our audience tonight uh, had relatives uh, who served in World War I? I'd just be interested to know. And again, give you a little time to answer here. Oh, I lost my, lost my chat screen. Okay, yeah, um, hmm, that's interesting. About 55% no, but 41% yes. Um, from the perspective of material culture uh, uh, curator, uh, the war, um, is very problematic in that there are many things that are represented and exist in object form, but as the years have gone by and our memories uh, and known experiences with the veterans have become second and third, and in many cases, even fourth or fifth hand, um, the material culture of the war is sort of receding into the background and the rarest of the rare, uh, and I make a special plea to anyone who might have known, anyone who served as a nurse or an army nurse, a Navy nurse, uh, it is highly, undocumented and underrepresented in the nation's museum collections. And you're seeing here, uh, in fact, in many places, like in this photo, photographs and oral histories are all that we have to document what, uh, what types of uniforms uh, these men and women uh, wore, especially in the medical services. But you're looking at a rare view of Navy nurses. Uh, World War I was the first time in which the Navy actively deployed nurses aboard ships. And just check out some of these statistics here of the 19 Navy nurses who died on active duty. Over half of them are from in influenza. And three of the four Navy crosses, the Navy's uh, highest honor next to the, I mean, beyond that is the Medal of Honor itself, are awarded to wartime nurses who were victims of influenza. So that just a sense of, um, of the, the cost. Now, on board the ship, we have uh, nurses like Sarah Sand, who one night is becomes ill herself and um, is, literally has to, in a sea storm, uh, grip her bunk. A soldier who's dying comes into her room seeking help and literally dies right on her floor. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? The army who doesn't want to get sick. Um, is steering clear of all of this or doing what they can, um, that, uh, that really falls to the Leviathan's crew to help the, the sick and dying. And they really step up and join forces with uh, the nurses like Sarah Sand to, uh, to help manage the crisis. Uh, they worked day and night, not a one of them got any rest according to one oral history, but an unfortunate aspect of the um, of the influenza was that it spread so virulently from person to person that they were certainly exposed and would later carry uh, the virus as they got posted to other ships throughout the United States Navy. Let me go to the next slide. 
So finally, the the horror subsides slightly when the Leviathan does finally pull into Brest, France. There's about 11,000 people who literally cannot get off the ship. They can hardly walk. And then one by one, they're carried down stretchers uh, to a convoy that stretches four miles, uh, essentially, to get all those individuals to a hospital where they can be uh, cared for to the best of their can, as best as they can. Those who are asymptomatic, though, continue to carry the virus to France. Uh, the 57th, for instance, has men continuing to die literally all the way up until the uh, armistice uh, from their time on the Leviathan, which is uh, sad. Um, we're looking at a French uh, hospital. Why don't we go to the next slide here. Now, let's just say a minute, uh, lest we forget about our friend Sarah Sam, the nurse. She survives and makes it to France, um, but the conditions there are no better than the horror she was encountering on board. One of her friends, uh, Nellie Gallagher, uh, dies in this hospital uh, here uh, from a swollen tongue. She bites it and bleeds to death from the fever. Her other friend, Nurse, uh, nurse Kelly, uh, is literally racked with hallucinations of soldiers who were seemingly surround her and she needs to be tied down to her bed. She eventually becomes so hysterical from fever that she has to be removed while begging her friends to let her go so she can be of use. Uh, she died the next day. She was 27 and that was fairly typical of the second wave of the pandemic. Next slide. The Leviathan is so vital to the war effort that it can't linger longer. And so it immediately heads back towards New York. And here we see the ship uh, viewed looking out over the fantail. There were 40 uh, dead soldiers still aboard that were given a burial at sea the next day. Their caskets were lowered over the side and uh, vanished into the ship's uh, wake. Uh, the war would almost end literally almost to a day uh, a month later, having claimed a total of 16 million lives worldwide. The 1918 influenza pandemic would ultimately claim an estimated 50 million lives. And let's go to the next slide. Now, uh, coming out of that experience, the Leviathan uh, continued to have a very storied career after that. Uh, some of its legacy issues here is that it was reconverted into back into a passenger ship. It was given to the United States in reparations for merchant marine tonnage sunk by the Germans during World War I. William Francis Gibbs, the architect tasked with this project, uh, will go on to great things. and We'll talk about him in one second, but why don't we just look at the next slide here. Here's the Leviathan towards the end of her career. Um, after World War I, immigration begins to curtail to the United States. And so that was the bread and butter of the great liners. And so they begin to fade into the twilight zone of our uh, culture. And they're just simply too expensive and too large to operate. It didn't help the Leviathan that in the 1920s, she was an American ship and was therefore a dry ship and was not necessarily the most popular during prohibition. But she had lessons to teach. And why don't we go to the last slide here. And when we come back to uh, William Francis Gibbs, this uh, young architect will later go on to design uh, the Liberty ship of World War II fame and other great ships like the Fletcher class dis destroyers, which inform his design of the SS United States, where he drew upon the conversion of the Leviathan, realizing that the SS United States might be called upon in the Cold War to serve as a troop ship. Um, now, it was interesting, though, as I was researching the Leviathan, I was really surprised to find no mention, and Gibbs was very familiar with Leviathan's wartime history and the uh, influenza experience on the ninth voyage. I was curious to know how he might have anticipated another pandemic aboard the SS United States. I haven't been able to find something, but uh, a good research question uh, stands. So i um, curious how this great Cold War liner might have responded to a crisis like that. Now, I'd be happy to answer, I'd do my best at least to answer any questions you might have about the Leviathan or the pandemic, um, World War I, uh, anything really. Uh, so uh, fire away and we'll, we'll do what we can here in the 15 minutes we've got. Ah, so the question, what kind of firsthand accounts from troops? 
World War I, uh, there was a great deal of oral histories that occurred in the 50s and 60s when the war was at its 50th, the same way that World War II really was until around the 1990s that a lot of the, the stories that from the boots up started to come to light. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there about the pandemic, but uh, the accounts that I found the most useful were from actually local historical societies, not, not the New York Historical Society, unfortunately. I didn't have access to our library, but there is a fantastic book about the nurses of Army Base Hospital 60, that's where we get Sarah Sand, and then the Vermont um, Historical Society that documented the experience of the 57th Pioneer Infantry Regiment. What was the eventual fate of the ship? She was scrapped and she was scrapped sometime in the 1930s. I, um, I'm having a, a moment of brain fog and I, I want to say it's 1931 or 32, um, but don't quote me on that. And it happened here, uh, I want to, I believe that it happened here in the United States that it was scrapped here, it wasn't towed overseas, um, but uh, I could be, I could be wrong. If anyone knows, please correct me. What was the reaction in Europe to the flu cases when the Leviathan arrived? I really, really want to know. Uh, I was hunting and hunting for that evidence. Um, surely they would have been horrified to have this additional problem added to their already ongoing war effort. But even within the archive of the United States Navy, I could only find one letter. Um, and the Navy's done an excellent job of making a lot of their uh, personal letters and diaries uh, available. You can find the Naval Heritage Command. Uh, one, just one, that mentioned the sort of repercussions of the Leviathan, and it was a, from a battleship captain basically complaining, saying, why did you let these sailors come aboard, uh, be transferred to new ships when you knew they were sick? This is, makes absolutely no sense. And that, that was it. Um, so uh, a, great, a great question. I, I don't know, I'd like to know. Was the Leviathan the only troop ship to host an outbreak of flu during World War I? It is the most, uh, no, uh, it was certainly not. Uh, there were English ships that carried it to other ports, uh, South Africa or even into various places in the South Pacific. Um, and it sprung up on other American ships as well. But the Leviathan incident was the, the largest. Let's see. Uh, can one find out what a particular soldier shipped out on? Ooh, World War II, it's a little easier. Uh, World War I, you would have to know, um, I would think you would have to work back from what uh, regiment or unit they were in and then go through the records of um, maybe possibly uh, the records at the National Archives. I really wanted to find a comprehensive list. I was hoping to connect Leviathan to maybe some of New York's great regiments like the 7th or even the 165th, the, the sort of legacy of the fighting 69th. Um, I, it, uh, without, without library access <laughs> right now <laughs> during COVID-19, I didn't want to speculate, um, but uh, you would have to kind of, uh, my recommendation would be starting from the unit and working back but the records are not, not as clear as they are with World War II. How did ships returning to the US affect the second wave here? Well, uh, I'm not sure if they did because my understanding of the epidemic was that there was the initial first wave that passed and, and did, did make it to Europe. Um, but the second wave, the more virulent and deadly wave uh, seem, seems as I, as I understand it, also kind of emerged with the cases in the United States and was carried overseas on ships like the Leviathan. I don't think the Leviathan was the one to bring it to France, but it certainly brought a lot of it to France and certainly the most uh, storied example. Let's see. Uh, did she carry cargo as well as passengers or troops? That's a good question. Yes, absolutely the ship would carry cargo, uh, but on the majority of these troop ship voyages, between the, the huge amount of army troops and nurses aboard, their gear that they have to transport in addition to all the supplies that the ship needs to carry to take care of its crew and the feed the men and women aboard plus all the fuel, uh, I think cargo space would have been fairly, uh, fairly scant. But nonetheless, uh, vital communications, absolutely. Monies and payments to uh, England or France to pay for arms or services, absolutely. Vehicles, perhaps in some cases, yes, um, but not a lot of space for it. Did the ship have any action with the enemy? 
There's, uh, <laughs> yes, both fictional and non-fictional. <laughs> um, I think I, did I mention that Humphrey Bogart was at the wheel and there was some lore that his, his scar uh, was created from a, a fictional incident where the Leviathan dueled with a submarine. It didn't happen. Uh, but submarines fired at the Leviathan on several occasions. Fortunately, they missed. And ships protecting the Leviathan in convoy uh, were also narrowly missed and engaged uh, with U-boats on, on several occasions. There's a great, uh, the Leviathan story is, is well documented on the, uh, the Naval Heritage site. And there's even a five volume, that's right, five volume history of the Leviathan. It's very rare, but if you can find it by the great uh, late maritime historian, Frank uh, Brainard. If you can find a copy, it's a, a fun read. Oh, good question. How many survived? That's one of the, the questions that's really left to wonder. There was a very, with the sort of breakdown of the medical organization on shipboard, and then that sort of fracture between the initial caretakers and those who received these patients in France, records were not being kept. And I think that was because, unfortunately, uh, these individuals were really being viewed as assets that needed to get to the front. They were literally just being passed along and passed along. And, you know, with the case of even the 57th, they're, they're moving to the front literally while they're sick and dying. You know, that's their job. They've got to get there. Um, and so I think a lot of the, the records of, that would be fascinating to really understand, especially in our contemporary time with COVID-19, with World War I, just simply got swept under the carpet as the war itself uh, took precedence, uh, which is unfortunate. But I think given a lot of sleuthing, um, historians will eventually be able to kind of tease some of that information out, but I, I really wanted some hard stats, but, um, you know, I could just get some basic numbers from the ship's records itself. Was there ever an attempt at mutiny on the Leviathan by the passenger soldiers and crew based on the gravity of the situation and the lack of strong leadership? We don't know. Um, the Navy wrote its own history, and uh, we, certainly when you read uh, oral histories of like the men from the 57th and of nurse Sarah Sand, who was basically saying, why isn't the army stepping up to help? Um, and the sort of describing the utter confusion on board, you kind of are left to wonder, um, you know, all these troops just sort of milling around the ship. It seems like it was intensely chaotic um, and, and terrifying in that regard, but uh, not according to the Navy, no mutiny that we know of, <laughs> but a good, great question, I wonder. Um, are the, are the records any of the records you need available online rather than being an old hard copy in libraries? Some of things are. Um, thank you, Google, <laughs> and um, and uh, certainly the a lot of hard naval you know correspondence diaries photographs have have been scanned. But um, there's still you know there's still so much to research and learn. Let's see. Uh, so Leviathan went to Europe in a convoy rather than making a solo run. No. Uh, when I say the Leviathan traveled in convoy, I should maybe the better way to say it is that Leviathan was so fast. Remember, she could travel about 23 knots. Literally, very few ships could keep pace with her. And the, uh, there was only one, two other smaller liners uh, that could trail just slightly behind. And she would usually travel with them or alone in the company of about three or four very fast uh, light destroyers. And they would sort of zoom around her in a circle, kind of protecting her periphery. But even then, she was still pretty fast. And there's one story of essentially the destroyer that was supposed to be protecting her, the Leviathan went into a fog bank, and they lost sight of her for the better part of the day. She just clipped along straight, and they couldn't relocate her. Then and get to your question, this would continue again with in World War II and Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth also extremely fast, could do the tr trip in about four and a half days, um, traveled solo and in secret. Question, were the dead buried at sea on the way to Brest? No, it doesn't seem that in the, during the outbreak that there was any attempt, at least that I could find, of burying the dead. They were initially when they had some free, uh, spare hands. They were uh, embalming these and preserving the bodies. I don't know what they were doing with the bodies when it was at its absolute fever pitch. It's a good question. The dead, most of them, with the exception of 40 that we know of, were taken off 
uh, once they got to France. And after, as the ship sailed back to New York, the 40 that remained, maybe those were the initial 40 who died and were stored in a special place on the ship. Uh, they were the ones who were given an official burial at sea, and that was about a day out from Brest on the return trip to New York. We have about five minutes, uh, so I'll do uh, one more uh, question here. Uh, question, is it true that the flu shots we get today started, or today related to fighting the descendants of the flu in 1918? Related to fighting the descendants of the flu? Well, the H1N1 viruses, uh, we believe that there is a, a link um, between the influenza of 1918 and the, and the one we know today. But uh, I'm, I hate to say it, but I am not 100% sure on the medical history behind that. Um, I don't know. And uh, yeah, well, thank you for, uh, for joining me. Um, the, uh, I've wanted to sort of dabble in that story uh, for a while. We certainly enjoy interpreting the Leviathan as part of our journey collection, but we rarely get to explore its role as a troop ship. And uh, this experience during World War I seemed timely and uh, something that I think is worthy of our memory, especially given the sacrifices of the nurses and the sailors who uh, answered the call a little bit ahead of their time in France. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, tune in next week for uh, where Dr. Marcy Reben and uh, project historian Dominique Jean Lewis will explore uh, black citizenship in the age of Jim Crow, a uh, special talk for our next curator confidential. Thank you.